Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now is a real life hero. That word gets tossed around a lot. I just learned of a story, by the way, of a kid named Wells with a red bandana who was in the South Tower who lost his life on September 11, 2001, former Boston College lacrosse player. That guy was a hero, ready to step up and save lives instead of saving his own. If you haven't heard that story yet, please go look into it. Tom Rinaldi wrote the book. I was crying my eyes out. So to get to chat with this man, especially after just watching that, and to chat with a guy who was a United States Army Green Beret. Who a, a man who was a long snapper, not only for the University of Texas, but had a cup of tea with the Seattle Seahawks. A man who has been pop culture relevant because of doing good things with his foundation that he started with Jay Glazer called MVP, which is merging vets and players. Ladies and gentlemen, a very handsome man, a man who held the ball for me during my Guinness World Record blindfolded kick, American legend. Nate Boyer. Wow, that was impressive. Hey, I honestly think you deserve that intro every time you walk into any room, don't you think? So? I want you to I want you to talk in that voice for the entirety of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nate, let's jump right into it because we're going to dive into a lot of topics. I'd assume. Yesterday, uh, today we were recording, but it, this podcast won't be released until Thursday. Um, September 11th, 2019, was just yesterday. As a man who served in the United States military, when you think of the date September 11th, what does it do to you? What is the thought, the mindset, things that rush to your mind, everything like that as a man who served for six years? Well, the first thought that comes to mind is uh, how I found out about it, which was, uh, you know, I was, I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I was uh, 20 years old and working odd jobs, kind of floating through life a little bit, a uh, lot of passion, but zero um, work ethic and application. Um, and it was early in the morning, man. It was like probably, I, I couldn't tell you the exact time, but it was around 5.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. I was in uh, staying in my little studio apartment. I had like a Murphy bed coming off the wall, like a little guy that was probably... Uh, 200, 300 square feet, tiny, tiny place. And, you know, my phone rang and it woke me up and it was my mom. And my mom, like, you know, she doesn't call me at 530 in the morning unless something, something very bad happened. And, uh, or I was in trouble. So I answered the phone and she just says, turn on the television. And I was like, what are you talking about? She said, just turn on the TV. And I was like, okay, what channel? She said, any, doesn't matter to any channel. And I turned it on and then, you know, I saw what we all saw. I think, uh, I think it was, I don't think the second tower had even been hit yet. Um, but it was, you know, it just, it really shocked me, uh, scared me, I think. And I, I just didn't, uh, I, I didn't think anything like that was possible. I think a lot of us felt that way. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was one of those moments that definitely put me in a different mindset and, probably changed the entire trajectory of my life, and I, I had no idea of it at that time. Uh, but after that, you know, the second thing that really comes to mind that I am proud of, and I guess when this, uh, when this releases on the 12th will be uh, the day that I remember, is uh, how we came together and how unified we were mm -hmm. and how proud I was to, to be American. You know what I mean? Maybe more proud than I'd ever been before. I never really thought about patriotism in that way. Um, you know, and, and, and that is something that we desperately need right now. Those, that, that feeling of unity and, and, uh, togetherness and kind of being there for one another when we're hurting. And, and you see glimpses of it with, um, these natural disasters that have been kind of hitting us over the last decade or so. But, uh, but I really remember that as just a time where we really came together as a country. I couldn't agree with you more i i've actually i let off my show yesterday with that entire thing the september 12th september 13th yes absolute devastation on september 11th 2001 
absolute panic by a lot of people had no clue that on american soil that could happen i think we all had the same reaction uh very sad but those next couple days man i i don't know if you can bottle it i don't know if we'll ever feel it again but it felt like the entire country was at a cookout together it really did and it was such a cool thing and then obviously us as humans and americans as time goes on we figure out a way to fuck it up obviously and there becomes like a little bit drama here and uh ignorance there and everything like that how long after that all happened did you decide to step up and serve the country uh and join the army and and potentially and did you have the mindset that you're going to go in and be a special force a green beret because that's top of the top when it comes to the army yeah you know it wasn't i didn't join till for, for three more years and uh i, I kind of did what you were just talking about i i quickly <laughs> sort of went back into my own personal rut you know not thinking about it at the time but i had we all had 2977 reasons why um we could be a better human being and we did for a little bit you know we were there for each other we were vulnerable um we were connected. Uh, we didn't care about uh, all the differences. All we cared about was, you know, empathizing with one another. I felt like, for the most part. Um, and but I slipped. I mean, it, it, America is a it's a great country, but it's a very comfortable place, and we have a lot of uh, really cool shit and opportunities. And with that comes, um, uh, you know, comfortability, and eventually. Uh, a, a little bit of uh, entitlement, you know, and we, we we're quick to to whine and bitch and moan when uh, when things aren't perfect, and uh, that's uh, that's a tough one to to get to get through. You know, it's a tough perspective um, to maintain, like how fortunate we are because we all want to. We, we we're all hustlers, like we want to be the best, we want to be great, and so with that comes you know frustration when things aren't on the tr- when the wheels aren't on the track and. You know, for me, I, I think I had this, like, glimmer of purpose and, like, okay, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to be a better man now and blah, blah, blah. But I just I slipped back into uh, comfortability and, and just, like, no, no, real, no real purpose, no real connectedness. Uh, felt like the world wouldn't change in any way. It wasn't uh, better or worse without me. It was just, like, kind of whatever. And... Uh, and I and I and I, without knowing at the time, it was a you know it was a it was a depression and it was uh, it was my own depression and and uh, I started traveling. I started going overseas. I was backpacking and different parts of the world, just kind of exploring. I was saving my money up and then I would go out there and just you know sleep in a hammock, sleep in the train, sleep in the hostel, and and sort of uh, just learn about the world a little bit. And that took me to uh, the Darfur in in Sudan uh, in 2004. And after volunteering at the refugee camps for a couple of months, uh, a couple of months, it completely changed my my life, my perceptions, my uh, uh, I guess my confidence that I could that I could go do anything, that I could be a part of something great, and I could make a difference in somebody's life. And my last week in country there, I got malaria, and I was put up by this family who wouldn't take a dime from me, this local family that had absolutely nothing, and. They, they put me in, uh, in this little mud hut, and they were giving me these pills. I was taking malaria pills, and mine didn't work, and they gave me something else. I don't know if it was for the symptoms or what. And they were trying to feed me and give me water, and it was you know, tough to keep anything down. But they had this little radio next to the bed, and after I listened to both sides of the Bob Marley tape that they had in there about three times, <laughs> and was just done with Marley, uh, I started flipping through the stations, and the only station that came through was the BBC, and it was like play-by-play play of the second battle of Fallujah going on. And I don't know if it was just me being, you know, messed up and sick, or uh, it just was, you know, uh, something uh, greater than uh, uh, something, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? From the heavens? A sign? I don't know. Fate, yeah. yeah, thank you. One of those words. Gotcha. Um, it, it just, I knew that was what I was going to do next. I was going to join the military. So I came back to the States like, this is what I'm doing, no matter what. And I started researching. I found out about the Army Special Forces, which are the Green Berets. And they had just opened a contract the year before that you could come in off the street. And if you um, tested high enough on a language aptitude and, you know, psyche eval and, uh, 
physical chest and all this stuff, you'd get this contract. You'd go to basic training, airborne school, and pre-selection for special forces. And if you got through all that, then you went to special forces selection with the rest of the regular Army guys. And if you were selected, then you start the year-and-a-half-long training to be a Green Beret. And I signed up with that contract, and fortunately, <laughs> it all, I just didn't quit, and it all worked out. It's not like I kicked its ass or anything, but um, <laughs> I just hung in there. And, you know, two years after being in the Darfur, I'm a Green Beret. Okay, so I I would love to dive into the hostel and the hammocking and how it was your... I didn't yeah, know, it's, a, it's another podcast. Yeah, exactly. I would love way. to talk about that. <laughs> and the potential drugs that they were giving you out there. And, I mean, I, I would love to talk about all of that. But I, look, before we move forward to the conversation, just because I'd like to know, because we got a chance to meet a couple Green Berets here in uh, the office, the 12 Strong, the horse soldiers that had now... Oh, have, wow, yeah. Yeah, now, now have their own bourbon... And they said their motto was something like with, over, or through. Like you, you, It's basically like a democratic special forces almost. Is that accurate? Um, with, over, and through. I like that one. Uh, yeah. was, it, uh, was, it, was it more like um, by, with, and through? Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> I knew there was something there. I mean, but, you got two out of three. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But it is yeah. like you guys are known for being like a democratic bunch, like not just being yeah. being dropped in yeah. for war, like that ability of your world traveling that you did before then and staying in a mud hut there in Sudan probably actually set you up to be a Green Beret a lot more than you could have ever imagined. Totally. Yeah. A warrior diplomat is a term we use a lot. And uh, absolutely. I mean, we do foreign internal defense when we go to – Iraq, Afghanistan, Timbuktu, it doesn't matter. Uh, we work with the locals. Um, we train, advise, assist them. Uh, we also fight alongside them. Sometimes we live with them, and they become our brothers in arms as well. And through those relationships, those friendships, uh, we're able to have a bigger impact in that area. You know, And y- you have to embrace the community. You have to understand what they want and care about that. And I think most people in the military do anyway. I will say that, especially ones that are a little bit older, a little more experienced. Um, but at another level in the special forces, that's what you have to be. Uh, it's 12 man teams, you know, and you're out there, um, sometimes training hundreds and thousands of people, um, and, and working with them and, and, you know, getting over language and cultural barriers and customs and, you know, religion barriers and all these things that are, uh, can be very complicated. But when you get down to it, if you just hang out with someone, and you teach them something, and they teach you, teach you something, and you have a conversation, um, you know, we are a lot more than different, similar than different. Um, and, and I think everybody knows that. We just kind of forget it. And it's, and it's easy to forget that when on the outside nothing looks the same. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an important piece to that, and you're absolutely right. Like, that trip there was sort of my first Special Forces mission without really knowing it, um, and it set me up for that. But also, like, I remember reading about what Green Berets actually do <laughs> once I got back. Because I had this image of Rambo with, like, <laughs> older, you know, cigar and, like, the, the bullets you know, over the shoulders, uh, uh, 762 rounds and no shirt. And it's not that at all. But uh, it is very cool. It's actually cooler, in my opinion. You guys don't get a lot. Uh, there's not a lot of talk about Green Berets. No. And I'm excited that I'm getting to learn more and more about them. Uh, obviously, very thankful for your service to our country and to the world. Uh, and after you had a six-year, I don't want to say stint. That sounds like a career. Hey, uh, you, were, uh, you signed for six years. I had a, I had a, I had a cup of tea with the army. <laughs> uh, whenever you got out. Uh, by the way, what? Did, where did you go for those six years? Where were you after you ended up joining? It wasn't the Rambo operation. It was uh, much different. <laughs> where were some places that you got dropped into to learn about? Yeah, so my first, uh, my first deployment was to Iraq. I went to uh, Nad- Najaf province, which Najaf is uh, the Shiite holy city and has the biggest cemetery in the world in it. Um, it's right near Babylon, so where the Tigris and Euphrates uh, meet. It's you know, within arm's length of two of the uh, seven ancient wonders of the world. And it's amazing, but it, it, it's very different now than I think... Uh, it was, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, but it, 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 the, history, the, history, the history is incredible. The history is incredible. And the, a lot of the traditions really are incredible. Um, so that was my first deployment uh, there. And I did some other um, 
sort of non-combat missions. To, I went to Israel, I went to Bulgaria, I went to Greece. And then when I was uh, uh, back at, in college, when I, went, when I was at University of Texas, I actually did four years in the Texas National Guard at that time, and I deployed two more times in that time frame. And those, both of those trips were to Afghanistan. So I did uh, three deployments in total, um, once to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan. And that was while you just picked up football whenever you got back at the University of Texas. You were like, you know what? Fuck it. I, uh, <laughs> I was uh, kind of bumming it in L.A. a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to be a model, actor, or whatever you were trying to be in L.A. Uh, you found your fulfillment, your purpose on this world trip. You became an entirely new human being. You get well-rounded. You go through uh, three tour or a tour and then a bunch of other stuff, and you get back. You're like, you know what? Fuck, I'm going to go play football for the Uni University of Texas. I'm a long stop. Is that, is that just how it went? Is that how your mind just works? Like, you know what? Nah, fuck it. I'll go play for a D1 college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I wish I was that cool about it, but, you know, I, uh, the reality is ever since I was a little kid, uh, I dreamed of – of being a professional athlete, you know, like that was, that was my thing. I mean, I didn't really, I didn't, when I was really little, I was into GI Joe and all that stuff. But once I hit probably five years old, I was obsessed with the San Francisco giants, the 49ers, um, Joe Montana and, uh, Ronnie Lott and Roger Craig and Jerry Rice and Tom Rathman. Uh, God, just tons of these guys. They were, they were my heroes. I was Joe Montana for Halloween two years in a row when I was five and six. <laughs> and uh, it's just something that never left me. But as I grew, uh, I mean, I was really into baseball and basketball. And I, I wanted to play football, but I was super young. My mom didn't want me to play. And by the time I got to high school, um, I was, I was, honestly, I was too much of a pussy. I was afraid, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm going to ride the bench. I'm going to, like, not be good enough. You know, I, I don't want to. I just was insecure, man. I was a 13, 14-year-old kid, like, the same, you know. And we all had that moment. Yep. Some of us are that. Some of, the, of us are that now. True. <laughs> but, uh, Very you true. Know, oh, boy, Nick. But I, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I yeah, so it just, uh, and, but it bothered me, and it never went away, you know. I mean, literally 16 years later, it still bothered me. And I was in Iraq when I made the decision that, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to, um, to, to reenlist uh, again. And, and, and it would like, uh, I don't know if I was going to have to go back to the schoolhouse and sort of be a trainer, um, which is something that everybody's supposed to do when you're in the, in the military. And I sort of skated that one. And so that, that may be frowned upon by some people, but I didn't want to go to the schoolhouse and instruct. I wanted to just deploy. And, you know, I mean, I think everybody wants that. But selfishly, I just dipped out and, and you know, went to college instead and, and joined the National Guard. But, um, but the main reason I wanted to go to school, I didn't tell anybody this at the time, the main reason I wanted to go is I just wanted to try out. I wanted to play football. I wanted to do it. Because uh, it, 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 it never went away, that, like, um, that regret. And I hated it because it was like the number one thing I regretted, which is kind of stupid, but uh, it stuck with me. And it probably affected a lot of my decisions through my teens and 20s because, you know, it's this fear of failure, a fear of like looking stupid or whatever that stops most of us from doing what we really want to do. And so I started training, man. I was over there in Iraq and I was like, I didn't know what position I was going to play. So I was like Googling and YouTubing drills, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, running routes and trying to learn how to backpedal and, you know, started lift, doing like the Olympic lifts and putting on some weight. Cause I, I weighed like 165 pounds in the army. I was, you know, very light. And, uh, and then I came, I came back. Well, I was actually over there towards the end of my deployment and we're watching, you know, it's football season and we watch football every chance we get. And it's like five in the morning and you're watching the Monday night game, uh, because of the time difference, you know? And, uh, and I just was like, I'm doing it and I'm going to go back and initially I thought about going to a small school because I just wanted to make the team. And, you know, thank God for my buddy Brad, who unfortunately passed away uh, in 2012. But Br Brad Keyes was my, you know, my big brother on the team, the guy I looked up to, my best friend. And he told me, he's like, no, dude, if you go play football, you're going to go to a big school. And I was like, he was like, what did you play in high school? I was like, I didn't even play, dude. <laughs> and he was just like, well, still, you're a Green Beret, man. You're not going to a small school. Oh. And uh, I decided on Texas because I just I'd been to Austin once and I loved it. <laughs> and uh, you know, Mac Brown had been out to, well, a bunch of coaches go out 
to, you know, on uh, like a USO tour type deal. And he went out there, and I didn't meet him, but uh, everybody that did that I, you know, knew out there was like, dude, he like made the helicopter wait for it was trying to leave because he wanted to sign every autograph and shake every hand. And there's more Longhorn flags hanging in, you know, barracks windows than any other team. And for all those reasons, I just chose Texas and, you know, came back. When I the day I got out, I drove down to Austin, and the next day was the first day of school, and the day after that was the first day of tryouts. That is awesome. I'm actually calling Mac Brown's uh, new team UNC tomorrow night. Is there anything I should know about Mac Brown other than he's just an incredible individual? Uh, man, there's a lot of things to know about Mac. He's uh, he's very so he has a, he has an awesome uh, you know big charity golf tournament that he does every April that you should play. You play golf, right? You're a big golfer. I'm fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I'm a good enough golfer to do well, but then that puts me in situations where I have to compete against people that actually play. Like, I'm good, but I'm not. Well, it's, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a scramble, dude. It's, it's, a, it's yes. a scramble tournament, but it's like, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's called Mac Jack and McConaughey. It's Mac Brown, Jack Ingram, famous Texas country singer, and Matthew McConaughey. Oh. And they put, they put this event on two day. I should play it. Yeah, that I mean, one. no, it's so, it's so much fun. So yeah. definitely do it on the air so he's like held accountable. But say, Smart. Coach Brown, I heard about this event. I would love to be a Smart. part of it because you play two like amazing golf courses. And then like last night or last, uh, last year, the headliner was Chris Stapleton. No. So they have like this concert charity event. It's so much fun, dude. So anyway, I think. Uh, What's he raising money for there? What are they raising money for there? There's like it's five local charities in Austin. Um, all of them uh, help kids that are underserved in the communities or, or disabilities, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they raise like $3 million in two, in two days. It's, mm. it's, Everybody, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty amazing. Well, McConaughey makes like $3 million. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah. but neither here nor there. It's incredible work to donate money. I appreciate that. Everybody says something good about Mac Brown, though, by the way. Everybody it's, speaks. It's hard to say something bad about him, man. You know, I mean, you, can, you know this as a football player. There's always people, no matter who the coach is, there's always people, players, that don't like him. And typically it's because they didn't play. They screwed they me. Some the coach of, screwed You know what me. I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. usually that. It's not because then you'll meet somebody else. It's like, that guy's the coolest dude in the world, you know, but it's like a personal thing. But, you know, Coach Brown is really impossible to hate. And his wife, Sally, mention his wife, Sally, because she, she runs the family, first of all. But uh, she's incredible, man. She's just like Coach, like she remembers every single freaking player's name, every player's mom's name, everybody. I mean, they just, they're just the real deal. That's awesome. I uh, can't wait yeah. to do that. I'm going to meet him for the first time here coming up on today, yeah. actually. So if you're listening to this in the afternoon, I am currently meeting Mac Brown right now, <laughs> and I am making him feel terrible about not having me at his golf tournament. <laughs> hey, let's but I think it's pretty, dude, he, he beat his two, and I, and I, I like both Will Muschamp and uh, Manny Diaz, uh, but he beat his two former defensive coordinators in his first two games That's at awesome. UNC, and he was probably not supposed to win any either of those games. Like, I love it. UNC used to suck. Wake Forest they also did. very underrated. I think we're in for a great game at mm -hmm. 6 o'clock. I've done a lot of preparation here in the last couple hours. Ty's been just feeding me information. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a barn burner. The offenses are very good, and I can't wait to see it happen. I'm excited to be there. Let's move forward, though, with your life, Mr. Boyer. Uh, <laughs> My life. I wish that line by your boy Danny uh, saying, hey, man, you're a Green Beret. You're not going to some fucking small school is one of my favorite Brad, lines of Brad, all. Brad, Brad, I'm sorry, Brad. You're good, you're good, you're good. Brad saying, hey, man, you are a Green Beret. You're not going to some D2 school. You're, you've made it through a, tra a boot camp that not a lot of people can do. You, you've done things in your life that you uh, most people cannot do. You're a special individual. You go to Texas, you do well. You befriend Jay Glazer. Is it after that? When do you meet up with Jay Glazer, and when do the does the stint with the Seattle Seahawks happen? Yeah, so um, you know what? I just remembered one quick story about Mac. I got to say, please do, please do. Okay, so backtrack real quick. So this is so I go to Texas. Uh, I walk on as a safety. I don't play at all because uh, I'm just too slow, White and it's really hard. It turns out <laughs> football's hard. It turns out not super easy, especially yeah. as especially, you know, at a, at a D1 program. But uh, so, uh, and, but I was happy to be on the team. You know, amazing experience. I get to run down on kickoff when we're blowing somebody out. But, like, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to start. I wanted to play meaningful snaps. So I, I figure, you know, the, the starting long snappers are graduating. Um, 
So there's an opportunity there. And that's about the, I've never snapped before, but that's about the only position athletically I can maybe hang in. <laughs> uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe holder, but we already had a supreme holder. Uh, and he was like, you know, the, he was like the seventh string wide receiver, but he was very good at holding. So uh, that was locked down. Can't, I can't kick. Um, so I started teaching myself how to long snap while I was, you know, overseas. And right before I went on that deployment, I went into Coach Brown's office and I said, Coach, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the team. Um, this is amazing. You know, I'm going overseas this summer, uh, but I'll keep training over there and I'll be back for training camp. And he was like, yeah, of course, like, don't worry about it. All good. I mean, you know, it's a scout team player. He's not too concerned. Um, he's just like, don't get shot. And uh, we'll see you, <laughs> see, you in, uh, see you in August. And so, and this is like in April. And I told him, well, coach, you know, I just, uh, I just started long snapping recently. started kind of messing around with it. And uh, I'd love to, you know, have an opportunity to compete for the position in training camp. And he was just like, okay, uh, have you ever long snapped before? And I was like, coach, I'd never played football before I got here. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, <laughs> he didn't know that. I kind of kept that sort of secret uh, for a while. So he was just like, well, yeah, sure. You know, you get back here, you know, we'll let you try out. And I'm sure in his mind he was like, are you kidding me? Like, you're not going to figure this out in three months. Um, but I go over there, I bring a couple footballs with me, and I snap every day. And, uh, you know, come back, and sure enough, he lets me try out for the position, and um, and I win the backup job. They didn't want to start me because they were just like, like he's never played, never snapped in a game. It's a different thing. Oh, yeah. Um, and they'd recruited this kid to do it, you know, so they got this, like, you know, six-ranked long snapper in the country, like, recruited in. And uh, so, you know, first game – uh, out there, he, 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 I mean, he's an 18 year old kid. It's, it's 101,000 people. It's like it's a different deal. He, you know, has a couple not great snaps and, and coach Brown ended up being the one sort of fighting for me. You know, obviously he makes the ultimate decisions, but like it's this, you know, the special teams coordinators, uh, call too. And, uh, he was the one sort of advocating for me. Um, so that Wednesday we had like a snap off at practice and uh, whoever uh, was the most accurate got the start on, on Saturday. And um, I started that second game and then the next 37 after that until I graduated. Let's and, go! Uh, it was, but it was because of Mac. I don't think there's, there's – I, 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 I would be hard – you'd be hard-pressed to find a head coach that would legitimately make that a real opportunity, a real possibility. You that, know what I mean? When you when somebody I, I know it was in the army and all that, but someone that comes in their office has never done that before, never played, and it's Texas, and he's like, "Yeah, well, t- sure, we'll give you a shot. Why not?" Hold on, let's think about that eighteen-year-old <laughs> kid. That eighteen-year-old kid, sixth-ranked snapper in the world that year, he gets recruited to go play at Texas. Hook him. He's saying all through his senior year of high school, "Can't wait. I'm gonna be a star here." Has a rough start, and then Mac Brown tells him, "Hey, man, on Wednesday." Uh, you're going to have a snap-off against a special forces guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you're going uh, to have to see if you're mentally tougher than a guy that was a Green Beret. And that kid had no shot. I'm happy Mac Brown gave you a chance. And yeah, me too. You, Because it, it's just it's awesome. It's a cool story, mostly because we live in an, an era, and I think it does get overblown sometimes. It seems like everybody wants everybody to fail these days. It seems like everybody's waiting for everybody to kind of fail. Everybody's waiting for a reason to take somebody down. To hear a story about a guy who was down and then find his purpose and then stay motivated and keep moving, it's a cool thing to hear, Nate. I I appreciate the hell out of that story. You get to the Seahawks. You get to the Seattle Seahawks. You're in training camp. It was a cool story. It was like, hey, this guy didn't play in high school. He got to play in Texas. Three tours. He's done a lot for our country. It was kind of like a – I don't want to say it was kind of like – it was a real-life potential, like, movie. It was a real-life potential opportunity for a movie there. You get to the Seahawks. You snap for a little bit. It doesn't work out. And then you become this voice of reason almost from not only from the military and moving forward, but for a lot of social things that were happening. Did you expect to do all this? Or is this just like you kind of you end up in these situations and you're like, why not me? Why don't I be the guy that kind of does this stuff? Yeah, I mean, that situation in particular, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the the open letter to Kaepernick and, and sort of um, being I don't want to say pulled in because I made the decision. I volunteered to 
speak a you know speak my mind and you know was was willing and able and happy to sit down with him when he asked me to meet him and uh but i i would never in a million years imagine i'd be you know in the middle of this social justice conversation i didn't really know much about all this stuff you know and the the, the history of of all kinds of things uh, you know from the from the anthem itself to um you know kind of the real history uh, of the civil rights movement and stuff like that and um and then where we are now and and having to um kind of really swallow swallow my pride and and, and approach all these conversations with like a, a a real open mind and humility and we talk about open mindedness a lot these days and and I think it gets it gets it always gets categorized as like a uh, a a liberal thing where patriotism is like a conservative thing you know what i mean and that is true. in reality like neither of those uh, viewpoints kind of owns open mindedness it should be everybody should be open minded i mean uh, some of the most closed minded people i've met are lean left and some of the most unpatriotic in my opinion people uh, lean lean right and uh and so I was just trying to be both of those things. I was trying to just, just listen and learn and be a part of that conversation. Like you said, be a voice of, of reason. And, and I don't speak for the military community, and I, I never want to pretend to, you know, to be like the, the veteran that, that just knows what's right and wrong, because I don't. Um, I was just trying to, uh, you know, hear the other side, whatever side that was, and find some common ground and, and bring us together uh, just like, unfortunately, something as tragic as 9-11 did. You know? The thought that you, some people, would think whenever you get involved in this because you, by, by the way, diehard 49ers fan growing up, so this really hit home for you, I'd assume. But the thought that people were like, ah, oh, this fucking guy thinks he knows everything. He doesn't speak for me. Any poor guy doesn't speak. I couldn't even imagine the backlash that you received because the Colin Kaepernick anthem, um, I don't want to say movement is still being talked about, by the way. It, 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 we are oh, yeah. years, years, years later, literally year, year, years later, and it's still being talked about. And I do believe it raised a great discussion for our country to have. It tore a lot of people apart with the branding uh, because of ignorance on both sides, I believe. I think it should have been explained much earlier to the people that were against it and for it that, hey, this is what we're trying to do here. This isn't a disrespect to the military thing. That's where I think a lot of communication got lost there and i think that could have been handled earlier in the whole discussion but the thought that right. you're a part of a pretty monumental situation in the history of the nfl I, I mean it's something you should be proud of i think I, I don't think it should be the other way i think it's something you should be proud of you've made your mark on a league that you were a fan of as a child in a league that will survive longer than us and it was here before us yeah that's true i i uh I appreciate that, man. And, 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 you know, out of it, I was, I was fortunate to be a part of a, of a show last year called Indivisible where um, I sort of acted as a, as a wannabe uh, poor man's version of Anthony Bourdain. Um, <laughs> but, you know, went, went around different NFL cities and met with community leaders and players and former players and talked about all this stuff. You know, tried to have these discussions, get people down to, uh, to, to speak about it. And it's a tough thing because I get – Trust me, I get more than, or as much as anybody, how, what an escape football is. And like sometimes it's like we just want to watch the game. We just, it just, we just miss football. It's like that was something that we got away from all these discussions. Um, but to your point, uh, it did spark a very important conversation, and we have to address it. We have to talk about it. Uh, and, and why not be able to do that through something that's as uniting as football? Like I, I think that's a great opportunity. And. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to do the show again this year. We're going to at least Miami, New Orleans, New York, and Cleveland, maybe some other cities. Um, and it's pretty cool to, to be able to, like, uh, to, to sort of do that and, and just continue to listen and learn. I mean, that's all about uh, learning for me because I'm, I'm really, like, I don't, I'm pretty naive in a lot of ways. I really am. Uh, and I think that helps me. I think the naivety when it came to uh, being a Green Beret or, um, you know, trying out for Texas. Like if I, if I, uh, if I knew too much or thought I knew too much, I probably never would have tried to do it. And I think, um, that helps me on this journey of just trying to discover and learn and, um, approach all these conversations and situations, um, with sort of an empty slate, you know, <laughs> with not a ton of preconceived opinions because I just, I hadn't thought about a lot of this stuff in the past. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's something that's, 
the, the, the debate, the conversation is definitely not going away, but hopefully more solutions arise out of this. And I think a lot have. I think there's a lot of players in the league, a lot of uh, police departments around the country that have uh, changed policies, changed the way they view things, um, work together in, the, in those communities uh, to try to improve these, these you know, relations with, the, with underserved communities and, and law enforcement. Um, and a lot of times through sports, you know, it just in, in L.A., the Watts, uh, now it's the Watts Rams, it was the Watts Bears. There's a youth football team that's coached by LAPD officers, and they built the team. Um, and it was all kids that a lot of them didn't have fathers, didn't have uh, much of a future uh, in, in their eyes. And these, you know, these LAPD officers in their free time, they're not getting paid to do it. They started coaching this thing. And a lot of people in the community were like uh, against it. A lot of people, a lot of co- other cops were like, what are you doing, man? You're wasting your time. And these guys said, no, I'm just going to do this because it's the right thing to do. And I want to try to change things. And, uh, and just this year, the Rams um, ma- made the partnership official with their team. And they brought these kids out like, I mean, literally like game day jerseys, helmets, all this stuff, and are like a part of that. Um, and just to see these kids that start in this league at eight years old, and now they're like finishing high school, going to college, uh, doing things that they probably wouldn't do if it wasn't for these officers. So there's there's all these good things happening. We just don't hear enough about them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's, I, it's so cool, man. And it's happening all over the country. It is. I think I think so too. I think we're we're inching towards uh, perfection, and it'll. There's been a lot of lumps our country, and I think the the anthem and the kneeling was a wildly hot conversation and argument starter for a while. But I think it's ultimately going to lead to great things for everybody, and uh, I think you played a vital role for that. Let's um, let's move forward. Yes, sir. As a kid who was just. Um, backpacking around the country, living in a 300-square-foot apartment. Could you imagine that one day you and a little spark plug of a man (laughs) who happens to know a lot of insider information uh, would start a foundation that would take care of vets and American heroes while linking them up with professional athletes and musicians in creating a community for military uh, to kind of feel like they're whole again after they serve in your MVP foundation that is happening with Jay Glazer is something that's magical. How did your friendship with Jay Glazer start? And what was, what is the goal of the MVP foundation? Yeah. Um, it's, I never would have imagined that like really just like I, you know, mentioned, I, I couldn't imagine being involved in a social justice conversation. I couldn't imagine being a green beret and actually, you know, making a, that kid's dream come true of getting a shot in the NFL. Um, but when I came out, I came out to L.A. after I graduated. Um, I had to finish, I had to do an internship to finish up my degree, or my master's degree. So I, I did an internship uh, with Peter Berg, who's a you know filmmaker, um, makes a lot of military and football-related content. And, um, I, 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 Matt, Nate, you're going to say something good there? Uh, 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 I don't want to interrupt right. you. Peter Berg? No. Probably a great guy. Probably a great guy. Makes great content. Uh, just completely blew off our show. So I just had to make sure. <laughs> oh, I had to make see. sure that I got that. Don't worry about it. Hey, hey, you got a master's degree from the guy. That's awesome. Uh, I just had to make sure that that is known. Well, he didn't. He didn't give me a master's degree. <laughs> you earned it. You earned it. You earned it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sorry. I had yeah. to get there. No, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah. Well, maybe it, maybe this will change his heart. Oh, know. We'll Nate Boyer, bringing people together. I like what you're doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Just be positive, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I came out here to do that. and But I also, I played in the senior all-star game, and some of the scouts there were like, you should make a, you could, you should make a run at the NFL. You should give it a shot. I mean, I was 34 years old, but they were like, dude, you can snap. You're going to have to put some weight on, but you should give it a go. So, I come out to L.A., and I'm like, I need to find a place to train. And I hit up a guy I think you might know named Matt Overton. Oh, Matty and, uh, O. Matty O. I hit up Matt because he was the only NFL snapper I knew. And I was like, hey, dude, I'm coming out to L.A. Like, do you know where I should train? He's like, bro, there's only one place, Unbreakable Performance Center, Jay Glazer, Jay Glazer's gym. And I was like, We're awesome, man. Who's Jay, who's Jay Glazer? <laughs> and he was like, he was like, you know who he is. He's like, uh, Google him. And I looked it up. I'm like, oh, yeah, that guy. A little spark plug of a man. Yeah, he is. Just as uh, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
yeah, so I walk in the gym, I show up, and, and I meet him, and uh, there was a Marine there who was, who was one of the trainers, and he started kind of training me, and Jay's like, who is this guy? You know, and he came up and started talking to me and told him my story, and he's like looking at my chin and the gray in my beard. And he's just like, uh, you're, you just graduated college? <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I explained the whole thing to him. And, uh, you know, he started training me. And um, draft day rolls around. And I had, uh, uh, you know, the, it was the St. Louis Rams at the time. The St. Louis Rams and, uh, and the Seattle Seahawks, uh, you know, both, both reached out and wanted to sign me. And, and he was like, dude, you got to go to Seattle, man. He's, he was friends with John Schneider and, um, and all that. And, you know, I think he put a few good words in for me there. Um, so, you know, th- that's why I went, ended up going up there. And then when I got cut, you know, I played in, played in one preseason game. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, that's just how that shit goes. And I was obviously uh, an underdog. And uh, but I did well, did, did everything I could. Um, so no regrets on that. But I, I come back to L.A. and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. I'm considering going back in the military, to be honest, because I just was like, I didn't want to sit around and wait for something to happen. And that's when Jay approached me about this. Uh, he'd been wanting to start a foundation. He'd been wanting to do something with, uh, with athletes, um, but involving veterans. You know, and we started having conversations about it. And the thing that stuck out to us was just like the similarities in uh, how difficult that transition can be. You know, losing the identity with the uniform, the locker room, the team, uh, the purpose. Um, very physical in nature, both of those jobs, especially as special operations vets and like, you know, MMA fighters, football players, hockey players, some of these real physical jobs. And then it was like, uh, you know, I was 34 and that's very old to be finishing your career um, as a, you know, a, spe- a special operations uh, veteran or a, a football player. A lot of these guys are a lot younger. A lot of them, you know, some of these young Marines, they join at 17 and, you know, they're out at like 21, 22 and they've done all these incredible, crazy things, and then they come back into the real world, and, and it's just tough to, you know, get yourself going and find your niche and like feel like you belong. Uh, and that's the number one, uh, the number one uh, creditor, unfortunately, to suicide. And there's 22 veterans a day that are taking their own lives, and it's happening to athletes as well. You know, we all think, oh, they make a lot of money, they're playing a game. How can, how bad can life be? But it's like, it's tough to understand that's the sacrifice that has to go in to be an elite to playing at that level. And, I'm not comparing war to playing a sport, but like when you no longer have that team, you know, and that, and that uniform, in that locker room, it is very challenging. It's really hard. So there's that mutual respect between the two groups. So we brought these guys together. We train on a weekly basis at a, uh, at unbreakable here in LA. Most of the first vets we brought, brought into the gym were like these six dudes that were living in a homeless shelter on sunset Boulevard. Um, Speaking of a movie, I wrote a script about that. And we're going to make this damn movie. You're probably going to be in it, Pat. <laughs> hey, but anyway, hey, I'm right. Re- um, hey, hey, I'll get in shape right. if you need me. I'll take all the steroids if you need me to get that. <laughs> okay. All right, that's not what this movie is at all. But anyway, okay. Right. Well, I didn't know. There's yeah. a gym. There's vats. You just let me know if you need me to look better. I'll, I'll try to figure it you out. You just want just just want juice. You just want juice. <laughs> yeah, right. just for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, and then we were bring. I mean, the guys that Jay brought in, you know, like his. His little crews like Michael Strahan and Tony Gonzalez and Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell and like these guys are coming in, training with these vets that are living in a homeless shelter that feel like they just nobody gives a shit and they don't matter anymore and you know the, their best years are behind them and they're like in their twenties maybe thirties, and it's like it wasn't like an these guys weren't making an appearance these athletes they weren't coming in to like you know shake their hands and just say thanks for your service it was like we're gonna work out together we're gonna actually. Uh, talk about our struggles uh, very openly. And, you know, one that always sticks out to me with Tony Gonzalez, you know, he comes in and shares a story that he'd never share with anybody except his wife, just talking about uh, three months after he was retired, and he knew he was going to have a broadcasting career. He knew he'd be in the Hall of Fame, you know, in, a, in four years or whatever and all those things. But he was out to dinner with her. They went, they went out to Italy on vacation, just them two, and, like, he was just not himself. She could tell he was distant. I think she was probably worried, you know, that their marriage was on the rocks or whatever. And he like broke down at dinner and just started crying. And she was like, what is wrong with you? You know? And and he just said, I, uh, I've peaked and I'll never be great again. You know? And I know that. And it's, I'm 37 years old and, uh, that's really hard to, (laughs) you know, to come to grips with. And, and it just like, he had not released, you know, he had not talked about it. He not, and he said like that, that release of that emotion and of just like speaking those words just 
helped him monumentally, just admitting this is where he was at. And that's what we kind of do in the gym. I mean, we, we, we train together, and then we talk about those stories. And we talk about the good stuff, too, and, like, uh, triumphs that we're having now. And, and, uh, but when we're struggling with stuff and when, when, when anniversaries of fallen brothers roll around and stuff like that, like, that's the time to be with uh, our brothers, you know? That's the time to, like, do something together to celebrate those lives, um, not to isolate and, and run away from all that stuff because it doesn't go away. And, and, and when you take, you know, when you, when you kill yourself, man, uh, I've, I've had plenty of, plenty of brothers do it. I had, a, I had a girl that I used to date, not in the military, uh, that did that. And the pain doesn't go away. It just gets passed on. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and we don't want to, we got enough burdens as it is just being human beings, man. It's already, life's already hard. And uh, that just that just makes it even harder, and and so we don't want that to be an option. You know, we've got to we've got to do something about that, and and it's all about community and just making sure everyone understands that they belong, they matter, and they still got a lot to give this world. Man, it's incredible work you're doing, sir. Absolutely incredible work. Was the Thank Mar- you, brother. the Marine was Gabe? Gabe was the Marine over there. Yeah, that's right. Gabe and I, Gabe and I, uh, by the way, very handsome, man. He is a... Gabe is a good-looking good dude. Big ears, but a good-looking dude. <laughs> Big ears, small hands, good-looking dude. Uh, I, believe, I believe he was a sniper, if I do recall correctly, with the Marines. But I was with him one night in Los Angeles, and it was an anniversary of a passing of a friend of his. And oh. the conversation that he and I had that night kind of opened my eyes to what everything happens uh, right, because it was a tough night for him. Is it? And I just so yeah. happened to be literally the only person in the area. I'd met him probably a month before that. We'd hung out a lot, and it was like listening to him kind of just like obviously he had a couple of drinks. We had a couple of drinks together, but like listening yeah. to it just like let it out. It was like uh, wow. I learned so much. I learned so much that night, and I was like, God damn, man! I hope there's a way that you can grieve with this because i have no idea what you're going through right now i wish you could it seems like this mvp is the perfect way to do that can't thank you enough for what you're doing not only for yourself but for everybody uh my boys here have been listening to this entire conversation we have a marine here he's a little bit older of a man (laughs) he uh (laughs) there's some questions you mind if the the room asks some questions man oh me no shoot you're the best Hey, Nate, uh, it seems like uh, you've put together a pretty simple plan for success. You just, um, I don't know why more people don't do it. Green Berets, learn football on YouTube, <laughs> make NFL. a Division yeah. one roster. Play in the NFL. Yeah, train in the yeah. summers in Afghanistan as a National Guard member. It, uh, <laughs> I, it, it, Pat mentioned it would be an incredible movie, and I assume if anyone were to ever make a movie about you, Peter Berg would make the movie. But who would you <laughs> we pick? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but who would you pick in Hollywood to play yourself? Oh, man. Um, I mean, you know, he's a supporter of MVP and he's a, he's a really good dude. Um, and he, and his right hand man was a, was a Navy SEAL. Who's actually a cool Navy SEAL, which is very rare. Um, but, uh, just kidding. Uh, but, uh, uh, Chris Pratt, man, but it has to be uh, soon. He's getting up there. He's in his forties. Yeah. I love Chris Pratt, dude. He'd crush it. He's uh, not quite good looking enough, but he's pretty close. That's awesome. I respect it. People say me and Chris Pratt look awfully similar. Uh, <laughs> just, if you're thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I said. Not quite good looking enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dicks. Uh, Nate, you talked about how you were in your 30s playing in college. There's a lot of these Australian kickers who are now very in their 30s and upper 20s playing in college. What's it like playing with kids who are 10 years younger than you and you're on campus with all these kids? What's, what's that situation like? Is it lit? <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the locker room, it was just, I mean, we don't really mature in a lot of ways past 19, like, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> so in the locker room, like, you know, not a lot of issue. I mean, some stuff, yeah, like, you know, it's just got to have that perspective and understanding that, like, you are that same 19-year-old dickhead. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yep. and, and a lot of times I still am. So, like, I think understanding that, you know, helped. School was like, uh, I definitely had uh, challenges with uh, coming back every summer and, like, just being angry, man. You build up a lot of anger um, on deployments and being at war and stuff like that. You just do. Like, it's just part of the process. And coming back and it's like, you know, um, you're sitting in the back of the classroom and, like, everybody's, they, they, they're in class because they take attendance maybe in that class, but they're just all on Facebook and not paying attention. And like, 
you know, that was, uh, that was things I would get frustrated with, but I'm just like, dude, like you're the same, I'm the same guy because I'm, I'm thinking about other stuff. I'm doing other stuff. I'm not like sitting in the front row taking notes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just, it, it just, uh, it's little things like that, you know, or, or going, I would, I would go, um, we had some guys on the team that were in fraternities and they would say, come out to the frat house, come out to the house, man, come on. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I'd go out there, you know, and then there'd be like some, some girl out there that's just like, you know, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just, whatever, you know, um, uh-uh. so I'm like, 50. But, but for the most part, dude, I loved it, man. Austin's a great city. Yeah. I'm 50. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, uh, I loved Austin. I love UT. And I, I mean, I, it's a very, obviously Texas is very supportive of the, the veteran community and the military. And so like, by and large, I mean, I was super welcomed, and you know, most of the, most of the kids were not just kids. I mean, it's a, it's a good school with a lot of smart people there and a lot of mature people, and even, especially on the football team, man. Like those guys, you know, they're getting ridiculed right out the gate. You know, the first minute they step on campus, if they like, you know, have a have a rough training camp or whatever, it's just like, oh, this guy, what a, he was a five star, what a waste. You know, we, we just blew it on this guy. What an idiot. You know, he sucks. All this terrible stuff. And they just have to, like, they read that crap, you know. Um, and they got to move past it. So, uh, for the most part, man, it, it was, like, no issue there. I mean, just little things. Yeah, you don't think about – like, I started thinking about it during the game I was calling. Yeah. Like, Matt said something about Desmond Ritter or somebody missing a play or mm-hmm. missing a throw. And in my head, I was like, yeah, he should have completed that throw. And then as I was going to pile on, <laughs> I was like, man, this dude's like 19 years old. <laughs> this, yeah, exactly. this kid does not deserve uh, no. me just tearing him no. down right now. But it happens. You know, That's real is, life. Yeah. As confident as he looks, he is literally shitting his pants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is happening. <laughs> Nick, what's up? Uh, Nate, seems like you've accomplished every goal or objective you've set for yourself in, in, in incredible fashion. Uh, I'd like to know what's next. Uh, what's one big thing you have that you would like to accomplish in the coming years? Man, I mean, I'm, so I'm, I'm back in L.A. Um, I'm, I'm working in film and TV. I want to have my own production company. Yeah, I've already got it named. What is um, it? But I know, ex- I know exactly what I want to do. So uh, I hope nobody steals this because I haven't, like, you know. Well, dump it. What do you call it? What Trade do you call it. it? Yeah, it's whatever. trademark. It's trademark, patent trademark, pending, trademark, trademark, all that. This yeah. is yeah. If somebody yeah, steals it from whatever. the Green Beret, go fuck it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we'll, I'll go after him because we got it on tape right now. <laughs> um, so, do you know what the class six is? Oh, I, I know two. At least two guys in that room know what the class six is. Does everybody else in, in the you know, on this podcast understand what the? Do the you class guys know what that means? No, Me no, and Todd no. know what it means. Uh, do you guys know what it means? No. Uh, okay. Explain it to the dumbasses. <laughs> I would never have known this if I wasn't in the military. So, in the, you know, on a military base, you've got class one through, like, ten. And, you know, one of them is, like, rations. One of them is, like, a- you know, a- ammunition. One of them is uh, uh, whatever. But it, every, you know, uh, uh, just, uh, what am I trying to say? Equipment. They have all these different, like, classes where, like, that's the department you go to for that thing. Yeah. Well, class six is technically sundries. But everybody in the military knows the class six as a liquor store because that's what they sell there. Like that's the number one seller in the class six. And it's it's not called the ABC store, it's not called seven eleven, it's called the class six on every military base. So the production company will be class six, but when it comes up on screen in like that Tarantino yeah. like eighties retro red red bleeding into orange, bleeding into yellow, grainy, whatever. Mm-hmm. The, the words will like slide together and the S's will overlap and it'll say classics with an X at the end. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty cool, dude. I mean, come on. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah, classics productions, man. But I want to, yeah, I want to have, uh, I want to, that's what I want to do. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just mine, but I want to be a part of that. And I don't want to make just military content. I want to make all kinds of stuff. Um, but I want to focus on like, having more veterans involved in this industry, uh, especially behind the camera. Because I've been on enough of these big sets now to know it's like, it's like a military training operation. Everybody, we've got chain of command. Everybody's got their different departments. Um, You've got you to gotta be ready for sudden change. Um, you know, you get weather, you get something goes wrong. Like, you've got to be able to completely adjust and, um, you know, uh, 
uh, improvise, adapt, overcome, all those things we talk about in the military. And I, I just, uh, I think we would, we would make some great stuff, you know what I mean? And, and as long as you got great creative ideas and people that are willing to um, work with each other, stay in your lane while being prepared to help the man on your left and right, um, just like we did on the, on the battlefield, like we, we would crush it and we do everything cheap because that's how we are. Like, <laughs> we would just, we would find a way to cut corners here and there and, you know, and throw our military cards in everybody's face, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> there is so much wasted money on those productions. I know. Uh, <laughs> it, like, it's next level in the amount of bureaucracy. I assume you cut through that. Excited to see how classics works. Uh, yeah. Ty Schmidt. Big yeah, we're, we're, it, it's, a, it's a ways off, but it's, uh, it, it's going to happen. No, it'll work. I can't, everything you say you're going to do, you end up doing, Nate. So you should, uh, <laughs> I have 100% faith in that. Ty Schmidt, big movie guy. I think he's a big Tarantino fan as well. So I am, uh, Nate, piggybacking off that, considering you were a soldier and you've been to war before, what's your take on how realistic war is portrayed in movies? I mean, it's case by case, and it's really hard to to super accurately accurately portray and I don't even know if you'd want to because you know as as it gets too real um it can be hard to watch and you know of course you don't want to trigger people also so that's like a that's a fine line to sort of tap in I mean I think the most important thing is making sure the characters are correct and like the dialogue is correct you know what I mean because there's certain stuff you just I don't know if you want to um kind of go there with with everything with the with the all the senses that you really feel in that moment but um yeah it's 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 getting a lot better i think because the more they have not just tech advisors on these projects but veterans involved uh, at various stages in the writing room um some of them on screen uh, it, it helps all those projects so i, I mean I, I like a lot of military movies I, i've always got uh, issue with something but i mean name a doctor who watches any doctor show or doctor movie that's not going to just pick apart the whole thing or whatever the profession is like a, a movie you know in a courtroom like they're going to just be like that's bs that's bs that's stupid never would say that i mean you could do that all day long but uh as long as they're trying to be accurate with it and and the more that films are um objective as far as politics go i enjoy like i don't want you to inject i don't want to be injected with some like you know a writer's opinion on like right. why the why the why the war was wrong or right or whatever like if it's about the soldiers if it's about the military if it's about the unit like that's not we don't get in the weeds on that stuff we're, take it we're easy oliver wars, stone we're, we're, we're <laughs> how about yeah. the how about the sergeant yeah. walking in well, since the government just made a law that doesn't allow us to blah, 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 we're going to do this. <laughs> that is, yeah. they do sneak those in there just in oh, such yeah. a clever little place. Lone Survivor made me feel as if I was potentially Peter. in, like, that was the closest I felt like. Is that accurate? Am I accurate with that one? That's Peter Berg, right? It's a, it's a good, it's a good yeah. move. It's Peach, dude. So I don't know if you want to give him. Fuck that. <laughs> God. Darn it! <laughs> um, <laughs> this next guy has a beautiful mind, Zito. Hey, Mr. Brenner. I want to uh, thank you for your service, first and foremost. That a boy, Zito. And I want to say that one of the coolest people that uh, watch the Texas games is Manny McConaughey. Do you have any good stories about him? About, wait, who? Oh, McConaughey, McConaughey, yeah. <laughs> uh, time. Yeah, I got, yeah, McConaughey's classic. So, um, classic. first of all, every time I've been around him, he's got a red man. In his oh, uh, jaw, nice, yeah. oh, yes. nice. And, and you can't see it, but you can smell it. You can <laughs> smell it, and you just know. And uh, but uh, you know, I uh, I'm trying to think, man. There's just so many good ones. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I have so yeah, many he's McConaughey just, stories. He's, he's just he's just he's just hilarious. But uh, you know, when 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 you when you introduce him to somebody, like I was down on the field for a game and. Um, you know, and I, I introduced him to a couple of people uh, that were down there with me. They're like, I want to meet McConaughey. I want to meet McConaughey. So I'd go up and, you know, I'd introduce them and, you know, I'd, I'd say their name and whatever and bring them out. And he just turns around and looks him in the eye and goes, McConaughey. And puts his hand out and shakes <laughs> like that. That's it. That's it. But, uh, no, nah, man, he's, he's great. He's, 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 a, he's hilarious. Um, I don't think he is uh, – uh, a, a real coach, you know. I think he might think that he is. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> is. Uh, I've seen him on the, you know, obviously in the football games. He's right down in there, and oh, he also does the damn hook'em sign backwards all the time, and it drives a lot of people nuts. He does like the rock and roll 
thing instead of like the, you know, horns out. But uh, no, but you know, when I, during like the basketball, it was a basketball game I think last year, and I mean he's an actor, so obviously he knows how to play the part. He knows how to look and walk the walk. And, oh uh, yes, he was a coach. <laughs> he, he, he's, he's wearing he's wearing the suit, and it's like a timeout on the floor. And, you know, coaches are huddled around, coaches sitting in a chair, uh, Shaka's, you know, got the chalkboard out or whatever. And M- McConaughey's got, you know, his arms folded, but with like one hand uh, up on, uh, against his face, you know, kind of like in deep thought. And he's like circling the huddle there, sort of thinking about like what, you know, <laughs> what an assistant coach would be doing, like walking that walk. And then he puts his arms his hands on the small of the back of a couple of players and leans into the huddle and kind of looks at it, you know, and then they whistle out of the timeout, you know, and he's patting guys on the head and on the <laughs> butt and kind of walking back to the bench, strolling back to the bench. No, no commentary, no words of encouragement, just like, you know, what, you know, what do we need to do to stop these guys? You know, I really need to like break this down. Like what do you, cause I, I, I know I got a pearl of wisdom to throw it shock. I'm just going to find the exact, uh, uh, scheme that's going to get this thing done and it's just so funny because i'm just like i don't even know i remember watching uh how to lose a guy in 10 days and, and listening to his uh commentary during the, the he's Knicks. watching a Knicks game on yeah. tv or something or in the thing and it's just like i mean it's probably bad writing too but i'm just like dude this guy i, I don't know if he really knows what basketball is, <laughs> so is he, going on here hey, is he like, just, nobody says nobody says any of those things you're saying right now is he just right trolling on. So, like, he's on the sideline of the football game with the hat on, and they're they're zooming in on him, and he gave the classic fuck. Oh, on dude, on got, the on the basketball game, he, he was telling people to stand up on the bench. He walked over with his suit on, was telling oh, players. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's so right. is that he was, just trolling over there? He's just trolling everything? No, I mean, he you know, he's the minister of culture at the University of Texas. That is <laughs> his, official, his official title. And, uh, you know, he, he, he teaches classes over there. And uh, he's just trying to, you know, get that Texas attitude back, uh, you know, injected in the players and keep everybody excited. And, you know, there's, there's, there may be a line, uh, but McConaughey uh, can cross it. He can do whatever he wants. I mean, it's true. You know, Foxy, what do you got? Yeah, Nate, I'll keep it simple. I just want to know who you think is going to win the Super Bowl this year. I like it. I like Patriots. It. Yep. Is it, Patriots. It, I, I don't even think it's a question. I mean, no. <laughs> I've said this a couple of times this week because it is such a hilarious stat. The Super Bowl this year is on Groundhog's Day. And it just no, feels as just if stupid. yes, it's all it is all just coming together for them. But there's a lot of great teams. Clinton Portis broke it down yesterday on the radio show. There's a lot of great teams. Kansas City Chiefs picked up Sean McCoy. They got great. All of a sudden, uh, the New Orleans Saints are back. They can't be heartbroken yet again, can they? The Rams maybe no. they'll play. It, it's just, it, it does feel like it's Patriots here though. Yeah, well, it would, it would be very cool to see Tom and Drew one more time. You know what I mean? That would be really cool. And I would have to pull for Drew. You know, you gotta, you got to, uh, if you're not a Patriots fan. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, if I was a pick two right now, it's obviously super early. But I would say, yeah, Saints and Pats in the Super Bowl. I mean, those are the best two teams I think in the league, anyway. Agreed. All right, last guy here, and then we'll send you on your way. Thank you so much for your time, by the way, Nate. Not only of course, in the military, but here chatting today. Your story is an incredible one. I think people will enjoy. This last guy's from Canada, so uh, go ahead and take that with whatever you need to do. His name's Gumpy. Hey, Nate, you were in the movie Den of Thieves. I'm just wondering if anybody on the cast you were really close with. Um, I don't know about really close. I mean, I was only – I was out there for about two or three weeks for that. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I do have a funny story from – I mean, okay, so uh, Pablo Schreiber is an awesome dude. Um, he plays Merriman in that. And actually, Gerard Ger- Butler is super cool. I didn't have any scenes with him, but – you know, he's That's giving like, I multiple, love you guys. multiple, yeah, yeah. multiple, multiple <laughs> shout outs. He's just a, he's a good dude, man. What'd you say? He, that's P.S. I love you guy. That's right. It's the P.S. I love you guy. Sure is. Yeah. He's good. Um, he's, good he's hard. To, he, 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 yeah. He is a, he's a sexy man too. I'm not going to lie, man. Yeah, he uh, is charming. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Uh, uh, sure he's writing letters from the grave. But, uh, oh, geez. <laughs> but, uh, uh, oh, so on set, so during one of the scenes, I'm like, I'm walking down, uh, I'm like playing a, uh, the Secret Service guard at the Federal Reserve, right? So I'm supposed to be protecting all this money that gets stolen. So I obviously suck at my job. But uh, I'm like strolling down and, and uh, 50 Cent is, is 
undercover, you know, dr- dressed up uh, in a in a uh, like a armored like what do they call it? The armored truck, you know, guard yep. uniform or whatever. And he's like sitting there, and you know, I walk by him a few times in, in the scene, and and we run it again, and the director's like, hey, you know, when you walk by him, sort of nod at him and you know, maybe say something or whatever. And the director was super cool, by the way. I got to give a shout out to Christian Gutigast, man. Awesome guy. And he was just like, he wanted me to be in that just because of my background. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing acting wise, but <laughs> good guy. Good guy. Um, but he was like, uh, so, so, okay. So I was like, all right. So I walk out. The next time I walk by, uh, I'm with, I start whistling that PIMP song. You know what I mean? Like whistling, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's the name of the song, but that, you know, oh, yeah. know what yeah, you yeah, heard yeah, about yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was just so trying I to catch it right there. I haven't heard that song in a long time. Great song. Yeah, it was good. So I'm like doing it and I could see the cameraman behind the camera out of the corner of my eye, like kind of nodding, like, yes. And, uh, we go by 50, we go by 50 or 50, whatever, <laughs> Curtis. Um, we, we go, go by, we, you know, I kind of stroll by him doing that and he just like, I don't even know if his face is on camera. They didn't even use the take anyway. But he kind of like looks at me and then sort of squints like, motherfucker, are you serious, bro? <laughs> <laughs> the stink eyes I go by and I was just like, so I just did it once. Next time I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that again. Um, go, but go, he was go. Very, that's he what was you should have done the next time. <laughs> yeah. That whole album is a banger, by the way. He should have been proud of that yeah. and thankful for that. Nate, I can't thank you enough, man, for taking the time today. This has been a hell of an interview. We've been to a lot of places here. Social justice, Iraq, Afghanistan, the NFL, uh, Fulfillment, Class 6, which is going to be one of the greatest production companies ever created. I don't know if Peter Berg will ever answer a phone call. He didn't answer ours. But, uh, <laughs> Nate, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, I hope the MVP Foundation continues to thrive and continues to take care of people. From all of us over here and uh, to you, man, Thank you for everything. You're the absolute greatest. Ladies and gentlemen, follow him on social media at... Nate Boyer 37. Uh, is that your number? 37 is your number? Yeah, that was my college number, man. I respect it. I respect it, wasn't, it was given, not yeah. requested. You know, you know how it is. Yeah, so I was once number... I got that, I was like, you know what? This is perfect, man. Like, this is the one nobody wanted, just like me. And I, <laughs> and I, and I got it anyway. I stole it. That's awesome. My number was 40 in college. Rich Rodriguez gave that to me as well. They wanted me to change it. I said, nope. That is my GPA, obviously, <laughs> and my favorite drink. Let's go ahead and keep it moving. And that's what yeah. I remained with. And they actually, the next couple kickers used it. And I don't think they had it the same reason as I did. Uh, just House in 40s and Mad Dog 2020s is a pretty good little run. But, Nate, well, I wish I was your teammate. You would have been an absolute gem to be around on a daily basis. Thank you, brother. That's not true at all, but I appreciate the <laughs> comment anyway. Are you just a fucking asshole? Or? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, uh, well, you deserve it. You're allowed to do whatever you want to do, man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at Nate Boyer 37. Thank you, dude. Thank you, guys.